Timber Talks is brought to you by Wood Solutions. Stay up to date with the latest in timber, the building material that is strong, safe and sustainable. Here is your host, Adam Jones. I got to speak with Dr. Andy Buchanan in Seoul, Korea, as he was one of the main keynote speakers at the World Conference on Timber Engineering. So Andy is one of the pioneers of modern timber construction, developing new engineering concepts such as post-tension timber with his Preslam technology, which he developed with the University of Canterbury, and he's also the author of Structural Design for Fire Safety and the New Zealand Timber Design Guide. So as he's one of the world's most foremost timber engineering experts, I took this chance to discuss with him engineering theory in detail on various aspects of timber design. So we got to chat about the first principle theory behind tall timber buildings, going through some of the the framing for stability and engineering properties, also how the development of new connections are improving the overall panel stiffness so we can design higher and at extra levels. And all of the new timber technologies available including cross-laminated timber and laminated veneer lumber products and in what situations are each of these most applicable. So it was a pleasure speaking with Andy Buchanan. I hope you guys learn as much as I did and enjoy the conversation. And without any further ado, here is Andy Buchanan. Thanks, Adam. I started my engineering career as a young guy in engineering school in New Zealand, University of Canterbury, and I did a bachelor's degree in specialised in earthquake engineering, reinforced concrete. And then I took that to a job office. I went overseas for a couple of years and did a master's degree in California and I worked for a construction company in California, got my boots dirty, then went back to New Zealand and worked for one of the bigger consulting firms for 10 years, mostly working on concrete and steel buildings and that's when I got interested in wood. I really, my first interest in wood really came about nothing to do with engineering. I was trying to save the forest with a, a bunch of greenies. And uh, about that time, a, a Canadian professor came to New Zealand, Professor Borg Madsen, who was a famous Canadian wood engineer, and he, he said to me, why don't you come to Canada and do a PhD in timber engineering? I had no idea you could do a PhD in timber engineering. But uh, I had to talk to my wife, and before I knew it, off we went. So I studied timber engineering in Canada, came back to New Zealand, uh, set up my own consulting business for a few years until the university tapped me on the shoulder and I spent uh, 25 years teaching timber engineering. But I've retired from the university and now I'm back doing consulting, which is what I love. So you've you've got a, a bit of experience with concrete as well and timber so you can understand the difference between the two materials. So concrete, we see big, 100 story buildings. I like to just start with by saying um, what differences are in the material to uh, for timber, not to perhaps build as tall as, as concrete, and in what ways can we try and build tall, taller timber buildings? Yeah, well, everybody asks that question how high can we go with wood? And there are some plans floating around in London and Chicago for buildings which are 40, 50 stories, but my view is that that's not, that's not the place to go with wood. Uh, high strength concrete and structural steel, that's their territory. Um, but certainly in the, in the 5, 10, 15 story range, no trouble at all with wood. We, we now have all sorts of new connection technology for wood. Let's go back a step. Mm-hmm. Um, concrete starts life as liquid and you can pour it into a mould. Steel, you can weld it, high temperature welding, and you can weld bits together. The the big problem with wood construction is that we start with straight sticks of wood, which come out of the sawmill or out of the uh, wood processing factory, and we have to connect them together. And that used to be a big problem, but that problem is being solved because we have Uh, super screws, you know, you can buy wood screws a metre long now, self-drilling screws. There's a whole range of of stuff like that. There are are things called timber rivets, which are high-strength nails, and there are post-tensioning techniques and all sorts of ways of connecting the bits of wood together. 
So we can make whatever shape we want in wood and we can connect the bits together. But what, something we can't do is we can't just dial up high strength wood or high stiffness wood yeah. because we, we live with the, the wood that comes from the, from the forest. So if you're, if you're making a wall for a tall building, you need to talk to the CLT manufacturer and get the, as much wood as you can with the grain vertical in the building because that's the wood that's doing the job. Let's just go back again and talk about these wood, engineered wood materials. And the very first engineered wood material was plywood. It's been around forever, just sheets of veneer which are glued together at 90 degrees. And it's, it's good for what it does, but it's small pieces. The next material was glue lamb, glued laminated timber, which was taking sawn timber boards that can be straight or curved, and you can make any size or shape you like. The only limitation is getting it on a truck and getting it to the job site. Um, that tends to be made from, from thick boards. But then what's happened, um, especially in Australia and New Zealand, is we have LVL. And LVL has turned out to be a super product for radiata pine. Radiata pine's not the world's greatest wood, but if you peel it into thin layers, in a, like in a big lathe, and then glue the, vin glue the veneers back together, then you double the strength, and it becomes a, a super product. And if you want to make wood elements which are long and strong, go to LVL. And if we were in the in say using it in the situation for a core or something, and we want the strength in the one direction, is there any way we can bolster up a little bit of strength going in the other direction as well? If we were to get say out of plane loads from a elevator or something like that. Yes. Well, this, there's an overlap between the materials because LVL. If you talk to the LVL factory, they can make a cross-laminated LVL, which is more like plywood, where some of the layers are running crosswise, but they don't like that very much, and it's hard to make a big panel. So if you want a big wood panel, you go to CLT, cross-laminated timber, which is just timber boards glued together like very thick plywood. First, let's make another distinction. If it's a, a building with lots of walls in it, uh, which a residential building, like the Forte Tower in Melbourne, if there are walls everywhere, it's not so much of a problem because you've got lots of guts in there, lots of stiffness. But if it's a commercial office building with open plan floor area, you've got very few walls, and those walls end up working very hard. So, as you said, it's all about EI. And if you can double the length of the walls, it's BD cubed over 12, so you get eight times the flexural stiffness. So you've got to go for big walls. Um, next question is stiffness and again talk to your supplier because most structural timber in Australia and New Zealand is radiata pine and most of it is 8 or 10 gigapascal stiffness um, but there are there is stiffer material available and the LV, LVL manufacturers can go up to 16 without too much trouble. You'll pay a bit more for it, but they can do that. And so if you get the stiffness, um, it means that your walls can be a bit smaller. So let's just talk about designing buildings to resist lateral loads. You've, you've really got th three options for lateral loads. You've got moment frames, or you've got cantilever walls, or you've got cross brace systems with diagonal bracing in them. But by far the, the stiffest one. So the higher you go, you're going to forget about frames. You're going to go to walls because that's the only way to do it because you have to, the building code requirements that limit drift under wind loads and earthquake loads, uh, those kick in and so it's all about building geometry and how big is the core and where can we put additional walls to make sure that we've got a, a stiff enough structure that's not going to blow in the wind or, or have uh, horizontal vibration problems. Mm. Incredible. And one of the things you mentioned at the start of this podcast and you've got a, a lot of experience in is post-tensioned timber systems, which I understand you used a lot of for uh, uh, seismic purposes in New Zealand rebuilding a lot of Christchurch after the earthquakes. Does, is there some utility as well for cores and stiffening up buildings as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it goes like this. 
if you build uh, structural walls in a multi-story building, they could be straight flat walls on the edge of the building or they could be tubular walls around your lift shaft and stairwell, but you've got to tie them down to the foundation. And the taller the building gets, the bigger the overturning moment gets, and so the bigger the tensile force at the bottom of the walls. And, and also the tensile forces between panels as you go up. And if you're not careful, you'll end up with huge steel plates with hundreds of nails at every level, and it becomes a, a mess. So one way of overcoming that is just to have a full height vertical rod. They might be quite chunky rods. They might be 30 or 40 millimeter diameter, high strength steel rods, um, which come from the concrete pre-stressing industry. They're pre-stressing bars and they can run, they'll be anchored in the foundation. They run right to the top of the building. They're anchored off at the top and they provide the tensile capacity, so you no longer have to have a connection at every floor level. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a little bit about going taller with our timber buildings. Um, I'd like to touch on briefly on achieving, say, longer spans, and with concrete, we the paradigm is usually a nine by nine meter grid. Um, what systems are out there if timber are looking to achieve something similar? Um, so, if you want a nine by nine grid, probably you're going to have beams between the columns at nine meter centers. You might then have secondary beams that that run at half that distance, and then you've only got a four and a half meter span for your floor, and that's easily done. Four, five, six meters, no trouble at all. Seven or eight meters, you're pushing at nine meters. It gets tricky. So let's just talk about floors again. It's all about deflection, and deflection is about EI. So we're right back where we were with walls. So if you want to increase the E value, you've got to go to your manufacturer and get the highest E product that you can get. When it comes to I value of floors, it's just depth, thickness of the floor. And what you find very quickly is that a solid wood floor just doesn't make it because there's so much material in there. And if you're paying dollars per cubic meter for wood, you're it's much more efficient to have some kind of a box floor uh, or a stress kin floor or a, a fabricated cassette floors. And if you make those, probably the best way to make those is to use LVL if you get high strength and high stiffness LVL with all the grain running in the same direction and then space them apart into a box beam floor and there, there are lots of options there but you have to do a bit of work because they're not immediately available off the shelf. There's lots of trade-offs here but when you're buying wood or engineered wood you're, you're largely paying for cubic meters. Of course, the more cubic meters you have, the, the more carbon is stored in the building. And so it's good from that point of view, but it does cost money. And so the most efficient structure is going to have, have uh, lighter, more slender members. But there's one more thing that comes in, which is the fire resistance, because we're relying on the charring of the wood. And if, if the wood is too thin and too slender, you won't get the fire resistance that you need. So there's a trade-off. Um, so we're at the World Conference on Timber Engineering here. What is there any research that you've come across in the last couple of days that you think is really interesting and, and might have an impact on, on things going forward? There's nothing, there's no sort of magic bullet that pops out at me. But what I must say I'm very impressed with here is the, the amount of research that's going on in the universities which is being translated and being used directly. So um, to give you a few examples, this, this press lamb system of post-tension tall buildings that I've been talking about, we invented that system at the University of Canterbury, but now we're seeing this is being done in the United States, it's being done in Japan, it's being done in Canada, it's being done in Switzerland. And so when you see new technology being adopted like that, that that's fantastic. So that's, that's, that's a structural system. Um, I want to talk about two other things. I want to talk about engineering materials and I want to talk about fasteners. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to engineering materials, cross-laminated timber didn't exist 10 years ago. It's taken the engineering world by storm and we're seeing it 
all over Australia and New Zealand now with local factories. And it, I used to, a few years ago, I would have said, this is a, it's not a mature discipline. These guys don't really know what they're doing. They're struggling. They're finding, trying to find their way. But having come to this conference and looking at, at the, talking to the manufacturers and talking to building designers and architects and the people who are solving problems for them, I would say cross-laminated timber is now reaching maturity. And it's, it makes, it's going to make a big difference because it means you can design a cross-laminated timber building without being a guinea pig. As I said in my talk today, buildings don't happen if the designers or owners feel that they're taking a risk. And what's happening is that there is a lot of confidence coming into the industry. And that's confidence right through the supply chain. So the architects are confident to design timber buildings for their clients. The engineers are confident to do the structural design and the fire design of those buildings. And the builders are getting the confidence in building the buildings. And so it's, it's a combined effort. But with that confidence, we're going, to see, we're going to see more and more. And there will be fight back from other materials. But uh, the one wood's got a few things that no one else has got. And that is that people love touching wood and seeing wood and feeling wood and smelling wood. And you can't say that for concrete or steel. Definitely. Okay, thanks, Andy. This has come toward the end. Now, if people want to find out more about yourself and, and uh, the work you do, where should they go? Uh, the best place to go is to go to my company website. My company is called PTL, Structural Consultants. That's an acronym for Pre-Stressed Timber Limited. We call ourselves PTL, and the web address is ptlnz.com. If you want to use timber on your next project, the latest Wood Solutions Design Guide, number 46, Wood Construction Systems, can help. It has been developed to assist building professionals to confidently explore conceptual structural designs for timber-rich buildings and structures. The link to this guide along with the other 45 guides can be found in the show notes.